Welcome back. All right, so I want to talk about the Columbus Blue Jackets. Um, tried to film this in between the second and third period between Detroit and Toronto, and then I, I messed up, so got to start again when the game's done. So here we are. 4-9-4 four, and four is currently the record for the Blue Jackets, which by any stretch, by any measure, it's it's below what the expectations would have been. And I'm not talking about playoffs. I'm not saying they would have been expected to be 9-4-4 four, and four at this point. Uh, but the negative 15 goal differential, problematic. And they're playing well at points. They're playing well enough that if you're a Columbus fan that believes, hey, they can turn this around, there's enough evidence there in game watching with your eyeballs to tell you they could. But if you were of the belief that this this just is it's not going to work, there's absolutely enough evidence for that as well, including their record. Their 353 points percentage is only ahead of Nashville and San Jose currently. Uh, they're winless in their last seven. They're 5 and 2 meaning if they're winless in their next three, I have to do a video on a 10-game losing skid for the Columbus Blue Jackets. And I'll be honest, I, I, I hope that doesn't happen. Now, last year, at this time, on this date, November 17th of 2022, they were 6-9-1. and one. That was considered to be a disappointing start. They get a negative 20 for their goal differential. So their goal differential was worse, but the record was actually mildly better. And the previous year... 2021 on this date they were eight and five and a goal differential of plus three so there would have been some optimism at that point and of course they don't make the playoffs there the last time they made the playoffs was 2020. Uh, this is a team that needs to pick this up and quickly because tomorrow they're in Washington then the next day they're in Philly. Washington has turned things around after a slow start. Philadelphia ever since that loss against San Jose they've looked much better. We'll see how how well they play in this game against Columbus. And of course, if you're a Jackets fan, you hope they don't play that well. Uh, then on Wednesday, they're at home against Chicago. And on Friday, they're in New Jersey. So they just come home for the one game and then they go out on the road. So of course, if they lose that one against Chicago after losing against Washington and Philly, I'm back here wearing Columbus gear and talking about Columbus's 10 game winless skid. Uh, Sunday the 26th, they're in Carolina. Monday the 27th, they're home against Boston. And then Wednesday the 29th, they're home against Montreal. I will say this, there are no gimme games in the NHL anymore. Ask St. Louis how last night went in San Jose. There are no gimme games. Uh, this is why when I hear about, well, this team has an easy schedule, I guess you can play it that way, especially if a team's below the playoff line. You say, well, they're mediocre, so that win doesn't count. You have effectively wiped out half the league. And then there are teams that are currently in playoff spots that you can shrug at and go, ah, win against them doesn't matter. They're not going to be in the playoffs at the end of the year. So it, it really depends on how you look at it. But the overall picture in Columbus has been bleak for a while now. Uh, the record since the 2020-2021 season, including this year, 82 wins, 100 or 84 wins, I should say, 121 losses in regulation and 32 losses in extra time, overtime or shootouts, 422 points percentage. In wins, over that period of time, they are 26th overall, ahead of only Arizona, Montreal, Anaheim, San Jose, Chicago, and Seattle. But Seattle, of course, hasn't played as many years as we have on the board here. So their points percentage is 484. So Seattle's record is better than Columbus is leaving them at 27th if you're looking at points percentage. And they're tied in points percentage, I believe, with Arizona. Arizona has one point less. And uh, yeah, it's it's really going to be interesting to see if Columbus stays in this position. Now, when we look at the other teams that are down there, well, Arizona's been in a rebuild. Montreal's been in a rebuild. Anaheim as well. San Jose and Chicago. And you can argue Columbus is in a rebuild or they've been in a rebuild, but they didn't make moves in the offseason like a team that was in a rebuild. Adding Provorov, adding Severson, and adding those cap hits, a lot of money, right? Combined, I think it's $11 million between the two. So you don't do that if you believe that it's just going to be more of the same and the team's going to be mediocre. Uh, of course, before the season started, we had all the drama with Mike Babcock. He's fired. Uh, but Pascal Vincent's been pretty good, I think, as the coach. I don't think he has them playing badly necessarily, but we look at where they're at and where they were previously from 2016, 2017 through to 2019, 2020. They had 175 wins, 107 regulation losses, and 34 losses in extra time. Their points percentage of 608, that was good enough for seventh overall in the NHL. So Columbus has gone from being a pretty good team that will give you a hard time during the regular season. And then in the playoffs, there's mixed results. 2019, they had the huge upset victory over Tampa. But in general, playoffs and Columbus has been a challenge, but they were in the playoffs virtually every year. 
Uh, now we're looking at a team that could very well miss the playoffs for the fourth straight season. So their leading scorer currently is Zach Wierenski in 15 games, one goal, nine assists, 10 points. In the league where we have a lot of players at or above a point per game, uh, it's really telling that Columbus has got their top two leading scorers on the blue line, and between the two of them, they have one goal. Wierenski, $9.58 million cap hit till 2028. Um, since he signed that contract, there have been other far more expensive contracts signed. That contract's fine. Provorov, 17 games, 10 assists for him, $4.725 million cap hit until 2025. Uh, I think Provorov has done pretty well for them, but again, uh, it's an expensive blue line considering the numbers that we see from it. Uh, Jenner, 17 games, 7 goals, 2 assists, 9 points. His cap hit of $3.725 million until 2026. I'd go as far as to say that's kind of a bargain in today's market, right? I think Jenner could could have demanded $6 million a year, and I think he'd probably get it if he was a free agent this coming summer. Uh, Marchenko, 15 games, 4 goals, 5 assists, 9 points. $925,000 cap hit until this coming summer when he's a restricted free agent. I think the sooner they can sit down with him and work out an extension, the better, because I think his numbers will get better. I think that the asking price will just go up. Marchenko has been, I think, their most valuable player. You guys can let me know your thoughts, but I think he's been the most consistent. And Fantelli hasn't set the world on fire, but he's been good. 17 games, 4 goals, 5 assists, 9 points. Um, $950,000 cap hit until 2026. So that's a bargain there. And then you got Voronkov. 11 games played, 2 goals, 6 assists, 8 points. $925,000 cap hit until 2025. He's a restricted free agent that summer. So Marchenko, Fantelli, Voronkov, in the, all three cases, Columbus has control of their contracts for a while yet to come. Uh, but it's going to be interesting to see whether or not Roslovic's still with this team uh, come next summer. 14 games, 2 goals, 6 assists, 8 points, $4 million cap hit. He's a free agent next summer in 2024. So will Roslovic stick around? Will they move him with a $4 million cap hit? Will that make it difficult? Will they need a third third party to, to jump in? Do they retain half of it? We'll see what happens there, but Roslovic at this point, I, I don't know if he stays in Columbus beyond this season, especially if the numbers don't turn around for the team. Uh, Dan Forth, very good in providing them solid value. 17 games, 4 goals, 3 assists, 7 points. $1.1 million extension he signed for next year. So he's he's not a free agent until 2025. I'm not going to say anything negative with Dan Forth. Uh, solid work ethic, good option on the third line. And I think he's done well. Severson, 17 games, 3 goals, 4 assists for him. $6.25 million cap hit until 2031. So again, you may be in the camp that says, hey, you know, he's been good. You may be in the camp that says, that seems a little pricey, doesn't it, for him? But either way, uh, with Severson, that's $6.25 million. Wierenski's $9.58 million, so that's around $15 million. Almost $20 million when you get in Provorov there. And then you've got uh, Gabranson here at $4 million. It's an expensive blue line. It is. And Yarmo Kekalainen, I, th I think there's going to be some pressure on him. And I do wonder if their record continues to be as mediocre as it's been, does Kekalainen keep his job beyond this year? Good Branson, 17 games, one goal, six assists for him. Again, as I mentioned, $4 million cap hit till 2026. That contract raised a lot of eyebrows. But I'm going to say this for Good Branson. Uh, he has done, he's done a good job so far uh, in terms of the way that he's played for them. I Just one thing I have to double check just had a brain fart. I was like, is, it, is, there, is there another D in Goodbranson? There isn't as Goodbranson. So, uh, one, one goal, six assists for him, and I think he's been very good. And when Goodbranson's career is done, it's going to make a fascinating career video. Not for scoring purposes, he's not really a scoring defenseman, but depending on where he's been, he's been really effective, or sometimes he's been the scapegoat, and and really, it doesn't seem like there's much gray area in between. Lately, Goodbranson's been very good for Columbus. Sean Corrali, 17 games, five goals, one assist, six points. On another team, $2.5 million for Corrali would probably be seen as too much. On Columbus, a team that has a little over $5 million in cap space, it's fine. Uh, Corrali's signed through 2025. I think he gives them good veteran leadership. Texier and his return's been all right. 17 games, 3 goals, 3 assists, 6 points. His uh, salary cap hit is $1.525 million. He is a restricted free agent next summer. I think there's just the one more year before he'd have UFA status. And then Johnny Goudreau. So it's interesting that Goudreau, I don't reach him until now, 17 games, one goal, five assists, six points, $9.75 million cap hit until 2029. So Johnny Goudreau, when he signed in Columbus, there was a lot of head scratching that went on, but you could kind of understand why Columbus would pick up Goudreau. 
they were coming off of a year in 2021, 2022, where they, they felt they'd underachieved. And you know what? You have this narrative out there that nobody wants to play in Columbus. What better way to fight back against that narrative than signing the biggest name on the free agent market? So Goodbranson is is one signing and, and Goudreau's the other. The interesting thing is the Goudreau contract, I didn't hear a lot of talk about how it was too much money. I did hear that with Goodbranson, but when you look at how they're playing right now, well, Goodbranson's producing more and playing better. Uh, Goudreau was benched during last night's game. Uh, towards the end when they needed a goal. Line A was benched as well. We'll talk about Line A in a moment here because, again, uh, this all reflects on Kekalainen. Uh, I understood what he was doing when he picked up Goudreau. It has not worked. The problem is he signed through 2029. I don't know what you do with Johnny Goudreau if the season keeps going this way. So if he ends up scoring five goals, he's on pace for like five goals. If he ends up with 30 to 35 points, and that's where he's on pace for right now, that's not great. Even if even if he recovers at this point and he ends up in the 60-point range and, say, 20-goal range, that's still not good enough either. And again, it's going to reflect on the GM. No matter whose fault it is, it'll reflect on the GM since the coach has been changed a couple of times here. So I do want to talk about Lining as well. He's played eight games this year, two goals and one assist for three points. I think that he's he's still, you know, probably getting back into the swing of things. I don't read too much into it, but yeah, eight point seven million dollar cap hit till twenty twenty six. And again, it's problematic when you've got eight point seven million here, nine point seven five million there, so about eighteen million between Goudreau and Line, and it's resulted in three goals so far this season. A grand total of nine points between the two of them. And again, Line's just played the eight games. But while Line A, they've been trying him down the middle, and there was a lot of speculation before the season started of, hey, Line A down the middle, that could be great. Um, I mean, I, I didn't want to hedge either way because we hadn't seen him down the middle at the NHL level. Sometimes it can work, sometimes it doesn't. At this point, to me, the jury's still out. It's tough. It's tough to really grade it because there aren't that many offensive weapons here. So if you're up against Columbus, who are you watching? You watch Goudreau, you watch Line A, you probably watch a, a win roll in if you can shut them both down. With with all apologies to guys like Marchenko and Voronkov and all that, if those are the best offensive players for Columbus, if those are the guys who are going and producing the points, odds are they're losing their share of games there. Uh, Goudreau is supposed to be the star. The interesting thing to me is, too, uh, there's I've seen, seen people say, you know, if you traded him back to Calgary and you traded Huberto to Columbus, what would that do? And honestly, it's that wild speculation, craziness and everything. Johnny Goudreau took a lot of time to decide whether or not he wanted to play in Canada, right? And so I can't see a situation where that could happen. But honestly, that could work on, on for both players. Uh, Huberto, a winger that it just hasn't worked that well in Calgary. Goudreau, a winger out of Calgary, worked really well for him there. Uh, now, Kachuk isn't there anymore, so I don't know that you'd necessarily see Goudreau get back to his previous form. But this is where in the salary cap era, it gets tough. This is where with the contracts being as they are, it gets tough as well. Uh, back in the 80s, if you had a guy off to a start like Johnny Goudreau, odds are he probably does get traded, right? Uh, teams would probably be more willing and more liberal about trading and everything. But in this day and age, if you're Columbus, you kind of have to you know, lock in and figure out how to get him going. And uh, that's that's going to be the key, I think, to, to turning this around if you're Columbus. Now, in net, Merzlikens has had a decent start to the season. He's 3-5-3, three, 9 three, oh one save percentage, $5.4 million cap hit until 2027. I, I don't think they move Elvis. I don't think they try. Uh, Spencer Martin, 1-4-1 one, one record, nine oh five save percentage, $762,000 cap hit for this season. Uh, of course, Martin, they acquired on waivers from the Canucks. Uh, once Tarasov's ready, does Martin get waived or do they keep Martin and, and carry three goaltenders? There does seem to be this new trend in the NHL about carrying three goaltenders, which is bizarre as it is. I don't really have a problem with it. If it works for your team, it works for your team. So there are still some young players here that may very well factor into figuring this out. Uh, there's also the, the side, too, on, on player development in Columbus and where the player development is at. Uh, and for me, again, it becomes a question of, okay, so is it a player development issue or are they picking the wrong players? And, and I'm not saying that with Columbus. I'm just saying that's how I approach it when people say, well, this team has a problem with development. In the back of my mind, I think, it, yeah, it could be that or it could be they just pick players that don't pan out maybe on the scouting side, right? So whether it's scouting or it's development, 
it's still troubling. Now, Yurchek, 12 games, one goal, two assists, three points. Yurchek's a good defenseman and, by all accounts, should be a top two defenseman at some point soon in his career. Uh, Kent Johnson's had a setback. Well, eight games, one goal, two assists, three points. He's down in the minors currently. And, I mean, is Johnson going to come up and make a difference? Probably not. I think the, the frustrating thing for Johnson has to be, last year he was good. Last year he played well. Part of the reason I had some optimism with Columbus coming into this year was that I thought, all right, Kent Johnson, another year for him. He's got that year under his belt. you got Fantelli coming in. The guy's a star, right? And so you, you got to have a bounce back from Goudreau. It can't get worse for Goudreau, and yet it has. So uh, there's probably some blame to go around. Uh, Chinikov has one goal in six games. Chinikov, frustratingly, uh, bad luck around the net. Uh, I think Chinikov has a lot of talent. And then you've got Corson Kuhlman's down in the minor. Minor's right-handed defenseman. He's 20 years of age. Stanislav Svozil, left-handed defenseman, 20 years of age. And then uh, Denton Matejchuk, left winger, 19 years of age, first-round draft pick. But that's where you're at with the, the youth movement in Columbus. So uh, if Columbus keeps going at the rate they're going right now, who knows, maybe they end up having the number one draft pick this year, which likely ends up being Celebrini. But Celebrini does not have anywhere near the amount of hype around him that, uh, that say, that Bedard guy had this past June. So you're not looking at a player who's projected to be transformational, to, you know, no generational tag being thrown on him. And so as, as rough as things have been in Columbus, the one question I have, and, and the one reason I'm doing this video too, is because... It feels like there's some moves that have been made here by Yarmo that on paper should have worked that didn't, that seem to, you know, plug in where where there were some weaknesses, and it just hasn't worked out that way. So at the end of the season, if it keeps trending this way, do they make a move at GM? Do you bring in another coach? Do you say, oh, that didn't work, bring somebody else in? Uh, what do you do if you're Columbus? Because for me, the question becomes one of, all right, so they've got a bunch of these veteran guys on expensive contracts. Where's the team headed? And if the team is going into, uh, if the team at the end of this year says, you know what, this doesn't work, we're going to rebuild, how do you do it? Because you've got a lot of guys on long-term contracts here. I don't, I don't know that a rebuild necessarily can be fully done either, where it's you're tearing it down. As much as maybe you just say, you know what, this is where it's at. You, you don't try to make big additions in the offseason. And you just sort of ride it out. But let me know your thoughts. What do they need to do to get Johnny Gaudreau going? Or is it just not going to work in Columbus? And if it's not going to work in Columbus, how do you fix that? You can't buy him out. Contract uh, set to expire in 2029. So if you buy it out, you got, what, five years left at the end of this year? It just doesn't work. The math, because it's the penalty's over double the length of time. So what do you do? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below, as always. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you're browsing your way through. You just happened upon this video. Thank you guys so much for watching, for all your support. I will talk to you again soon.